Hello, I am Carly Krakow, and today I'm speaking with Arun Gupta, who joins us from Portland. He's a journalist whose work has appeared in publications such as The Intercept, The Nation, and The Washington Post. Recently, he's written for Jadalia about Portland, the protests going on there, and U.S. authoritarianism. Most recently, a piece for the Quick Thought series in conversation with our co-editor, Muin Rabani. Thank you for being on Live with ASI, Arun. Thanks for having me on. In your Quick Thoughts piece and your other reporting, you vividly portray what's going on in Portland, notably Donald Trump's deployment of federal militarized police to the city, and you cite this as an example of American authoritarianism. Just in late September, the Department of Justice identified three so-called anarchist jurisdictions in Portland, New York, and Seattle following Trump's memorandum on September 2nd. Could you start by telling us what it's like in Portland now and following your many months in the city, what do you make of this anarchist jurisdiction classification? The, cl the classification itself is just pure propaganda for political purposes. Uh, you know, everything with Trump, uh, he politicizes. I, I think that is uh, part of his um, dictatorial nature, uh, that everything is seen through this lens of um, power, uh, taking power and, and wielding power. Um, you know, certainly life in Portland is really uh, no different than any other city. All this talk of uh, uh, destruction and devastation, even when the mass protests were going on, for one, it was limited to a very small area of downtown, just a few blocks around the federal courthouse building. And secondly, uh, most of the the vast majority of the violence uh, was being uh, caused by police, or now what we've seen uh, since late August facilitated by police, where they've let these uh, right-wing gangs, basically fascist gangs like Proud Boys and Patriot Prayers, um, come into the city and enact violence uh, against uh, the public. Uh, but the point for Trump is, is that he wants to gain uh, political leverage about the, uh, um, around this. But we should, one uh, important point is that we shouldn't forget uh, that it's Portland police who have been the source of much of the violence. And now we're actually in this bizarre but and very underreported situation where Portland police and state police have been deputized as federal agents. So in effect, we we have uh, Trump's uh, uh, basically federal goons again, but in the guise of local police forces who are enabled to enact all this violence and repression against the public. Yeah, thank you for that great context. And I know we just spoke a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, I'm in New York, you live in New York, usually, and it is still standing and you're, you know, conveying what's going on in Portland for us. So I, I think that's important for people to get a accurate picture of, of what's happening and the contrast with how it's being portrayed. Um, looking at your reporting, you wrote, under Trump, Portland has become a stage where the far right commits violence against the left to use as a recruiting tool. And you were referring here to producing violence to achieve viral online content. Just days ago in the first presidential debate, when asked to denounce white supremacist groups, Trump replied by asking the far right neo-fascist group, the Proud Boys, to stand back and stand by. And he's since tried to blur the public's understanding of that comment, but many would argue that his record already speaks for itself with situations like Charlottesville and many others. Could you comment on this kind of rhetoric and how it incites violence and how that has played out uh, on a citywide scale in Portland? Well, si simply put, Trump is an instigator of stochastic terrorism. Uh, this is no different than what, uh, say, a spokesperson for a spokesman for ISIS does. Um, the The only difference is that Trump is the most powerful human being on the planet as president of the United States. He is outright. He has endorsed uh, violence and murder. Uh, he's a uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse. Uh, he endorsed uh, the murder of uh, the man who killed uh, the Patriot Prayer member, uh, Michael Rienol, uh, who was killed by uh, law enforcement officers. Uh, Trump uh, essentially endorsed that, so did uh, Bill Barr. Um, and, you know, this is just part of a longer pattern that goes back to 
uh, the 2016 campaign where he was endorsing violence at his rallies. He he was endorsing violence by his supporters. You know, we've seen uh, these mass uh, shootings and killings uh, by uh, people who basically sound exactly like him or are of supporters uh, of him, uh, such as, you know, um, uh, uh, Patrick Crugis, who killed 23 people in El Paso last year. Robert Bowers, who shot up the Tree of Life synagogue, killing 11 people. Cesar Sayak, the MAGA uh, bomber, on and on and on. But what's really dangerous about this moment is the state, what we see is essentially starting to cede its monopoly on violence, that it's willing to give space to right-wing vigilantism. Now, this is an old story in uh, American history, but the last time we really see this happening is with the civil rights era in the 1960s, where uh, law enforcement agencies are allowing uh, these uh, vigilantes, these white nationalists, to enact violence against uh, what are seen as enemies of the social order and, and state. And so I don't think we should blow this out of proportion. This is nothing like a civil war. Um, you know, we're a long ways from that, but it contains... <clears throat> essentially the essence of a much potentially greater conflict, particularly with uh, Trump's uh, threats not to recognize the legitimacy of the election. Thank you. Yeah, and you've just touched on some things that I'm very interested to ask you a bit more about. You've also spoken about Oregon as a microcosm of white nationalism and police complicity with the far right. And as you've said, we are in a critical moment, but of course what we're experiencing now is, as you wrote, one episode in a history of the state using federal force against Black-led movements and uprisings and other forms of activism. Could you share a bit more of that history of racism in Oregon and also explain how that fits into the wider context of U.S. racism and police brutality and especially as we face a pandemic that has had a dramatically disproportionate impact on communities of color. Um, so the history of Oregon is that of an explicit white supremacist state. It, it's um, w during its founding, its its state constitution, it uh, explicitly barred uh, African Americans uh, not just from living in the state, but even uh, passing through uh, the state at all. And of course, that was coupled with uh, essentially an extermination campaign against indigenous people. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, basically every state. Uh, west of the Mississippi was founded as a, as a white utopia, but Oregon was much more explicit in that. Uh, this continued uh, for decades, um, you know, up until the 1920s, it was still illegal for African Americans to settle in Oregon, and the punishment was a public flogging uh, every six months. Oregon, like a lot of states at the time, was a hotbed of Klan activity who exerted influence uh, over the governorship. It was powerful enough to to do so. Um, and so this continues on and on, you know, during World War II and the Great Migration, um, the Civil Rights Movement, um, you know, gentrification, uh, such that o Oregon has one of the lowest uh, population of African Americans in the entire country, something like about uh, 3%. Portland is known as the whitest uh, big city in the country. But this also means that you have a police force that is essentially steeped uh, in white White supremacy, and you have outright uh, white nationalists on the police force. There's one captain who uh, years ago was caught creating a war memorial to uh, fallen uh, SS Nazi SS soldiers in a public park. But this should also be seen in the wider context of um, state-led uh, and vigilante uh, violence against a pl a black uh, political and, and social uh, movement. You know, this uh, goes back to slave uprisings, then the Reconstruction era, then, you know, World War One and World War Two, uh, the Great Migration, particularly around World War One. you see all these uh, uh, essentially pogroms, you know, what we can call them, Tulsa being one of the uh, the most infamous one, where up to 300 African Americans uh, were killed in 1921 with state complicity, you know, then through the civil rights era, and now through the George Floyd protests. You know, we really need to see this all 
in this uh, context of that every time there is black political and social movement, uh, there is this violent uh, white backlash, which the state participates in. Thank you so much, Arun. Some, some really important points, especially always, but especially with uh, the current political moment. And I really appreciate your insight on this critical and rapidly evolving situation. And wonderful to have you on. It was great to be with you today. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.